there has to come this point in our life where we just say, okay, God, you're not answering this request right now, but I trust in you. This is what the psalmist is going through. He's sick, he feels like he's dying, and he wants God to heal him. He's asking for God to do something, and God's not doing it. But then he comes to this conclusion in verse 7, but my hope's in you. You know what's best. Psalm 39 is where we're at tonight. Psalm 39. Okay, I want to talk to you before we get going. I want to, um, before we kind of walk our way through this passage, I want to talk to you about a book that I read a couple of months ago. Um, it's called, it's not a couple of months ago. I read it a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's a book called Praying the Bible by Donald, Donald Whitney. Um, it's a very fascinating book in that it's uh, the premise of the book. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the whole book here in like 10 minutes, okay? So the premise of the book is, is that God gave us the Psalms, the book of Psalms, to teach us how to pray, okay? That, that if you want to really see the heart of God and see how to pray, then you should look at, at the Psalms. And so um, maybe you struggle with prayer. Uh, this is a great book for you to read if maybe you struggle with prayer. It's a, it's a different way to look at prayer, a different angle at prayer. Um, and so what he advocates doing is, is so t- what's the date? T- today is the 16th, right? Is that, okay. So what he advocates doing is, so you take the 16th and you add 30, there's 150 Psalms. So you look at the, so today would be the 16th. So you look at the 16th, the uh, Psalm 16, Psalms 46, Psalm 76, Psalms 106, and Psalms 136. And what you do with that Psalm is, is then you read it. And as you read it, you just, you, you do what the psalmist is doing. You communicate to God in the same way that the psalmist is communicating to God with whatever your concerns are. So, you know, so today I was, I actually was, did this this morning. I've been practicing this for the last couple of weeks. Just, you know, I think it's good every once in a while to kind of mix up your, um, your prayer life in a sense to, to do things a little bit different in your communication with God. It's easy to get in ruts. Does anybody else find that to be true? Uh, I think that that you got to you can spice things up a little bit. So the one psalm that I landed on, what so what he advocates doing is pick one of those five psalms that I listed. So for me, I locked into Psalms 46 today, which is a great psalm. Uh, God is our refuge and strength and a very present help in trouble. So um, I would pray and just say, God, I, I thank you for being my strength. And, and in a sense, I would even ask, I even asked God this morning to be my strength as I communicated his word, God be my strength. And then a very present help in trouble. So I think about the troubles that I'm going through. I think about the troubles my wife's going through and I communicate that to God. I just say, God, um, be, be my strength for during this time of trouble. Be Karen's strength during this time of trouble or my parents, my, my dad going through some things and, and different people that I know. And so when I think about the troubles they're going through, I'm lifting that up. And verse 2, therefore, we will not fear even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried in the midst of the sea. God, help me not to be afraid even though Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton may get elected. Right? So even though... Uh, the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, uh, help me not to fear. No matter what happens around me, help me to take refuge in you, God. Okay? That this is, so this is how you just walk through this psalm. It's a very powerful thing, and I would recommend, it's a very short book. You say, I don't like to read. Okay? First of all, you can get it on audio and listen to it, and, it's, and if, you don't, if you like to read, it's only like 116, 116 pages, I think. I tell you all that just to try to encourage you to do that. You say, what do you do on the 31st day? The uh, 31st day, if there's a 31 days in, in um, the month, you just read Psalm 119. You walk through Psalm 119. That'll give you plenty to do on the 31st day, Okay. Tonight, we are in uh, Psalms 39, kind of walking through our passages. And this is, I have kind of turned this into a prayer that I would pray, thinking about the days ahead, thinking about uh, the remainder of the days that I have. Because this is really the theme of this psalm. Um, 
I, I ha- have been more emotional lately. I have been more, and I think, you know, a lot of you warned me about this uh, coming time with, you know, the kids uh, graduating from high school and, and um, you know, Karen and I moving into the, a different role in life than we're in. And, um, uh, you know, when you got little kids in the house, it seems like life will never end. And then uh, when they start to move out and when they start to grow up and, and um, it's just different. Um, and I don't, for me, I know that I'm still relatively young, but uh, life seems to be moving really fast, you know. Uh, it just seems to be kind of trucking along. So the psalmist is going through a little bit of this here. He is obviously suffering. We don't know the reasons behind it. We don't know why he's suffering, but he's going through a difficult time. And he's sick. He has some kind of sickness, and he thinks that he's possibly going to die. So he writes this psalm, kind of an outpouring of his heart uh, for what he's dealing with at the moment. And so what I want to do this evening is kind of model this after what I talked about, which this is a prayer for the rest of my days. Um, I, I hope that God lets me live a long time, but the reality is, is God's, my life's in God's hands, right? And your, your life is in God's hands as well. And he sets the number of our days. And he knows what the future holds for us. But I know this, that I got right now, and I got today. And so I want to live each day that he gives me uh, to the best of my ability. And I want to live my life, a life that's pleasing to God. So I want to pray this. There's eight things I pulled out of this particular psalm that the psalmist is praying for or the psalmist is revealing about his own heart that uh, I hope that we will all pray as well. Notice what he says in verse 1. I said, I will guard my ways lest I sin with my tongue. I will restrain my mouth with a muzzle while the wicked are before me. So number one, the first part of my prayer would be, God, for the rest of my days, Please help me to control my tongue. God, please help me to control my tongue. Man, is that challenging, right? James, you know, talked at great length about controlling the tongue. He talks about, uh, in particular, chapter 3. He talks about how difficult it is to control the tongue, Um He says in verse number one, my brethren, let not many of you become teachers knowing that we should receive stricter judgment. That should warn you right there about wanting to get up in a position of authority. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man able to bridle the whole body. And then he talks about we put bits in the horse's mouths that they may obey us and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships, although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder where the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how a great, a, a forest, a little fire kindle. He gives three examples. You know, one is the bit in, a, in a, the horse of a mouth and how that, that's a little thing, but it makes those big old um, thousand pound animals turn just by that little bit. And you have these huge ships. You know, Karen and I went on a cruise recently and in comparison to the size of the ship, the rudder is a very small thing, and yet it controls that. And then he talks about how most forest fires or most fires are started by just a little kindle, a little strike of a match, or a disregard of a cigarette. It's a little thing that starts this huge flame. Our tongue is the same way. And good night, man. I, as somebody that talks for a living, um, you know, I need help with this every day. And we all get down and we all have difficult days and boy the tongue is one of the first things to go and so our prayer should be constantly God as I walk through this day as the psalmist prayed he he was he was I don't want to sin with my mouth because what hurts our testimony more than anything is is not only um, our actions but also what we say what we say is so very powerful and and we can sin with our mouths. And there's a lot of different ways that we can sin with our mouth. We can sin with our mouth by complaining. You know, complaining is a way of, of, of saying to God that I don't think you're good enough and I don't like what you've done in my life. 
uh, we sin with complaining, we sin with gossip, which gossip is to speak about someone behind their back in a very negative way to bring down their reputation to others, uh, even with untruths or sometimes with truths that uh, we know will harm a particular person. Gossip is a way that we can sin with our mouth. Uh, there's just so many ways. Lying is a way that we can sin with our mouth. Um, and so it's very easy to fall into that trap, is it not? I mean, we, we look at people that do horrendous crimes, and, and we say, they, they, boy, they're just such terrible people, and then we'll assassinate people with our mouths and with our tongues, and, and it just hurts the name of Jesus. We can, we can misuse our mouths by, by the words that come out of our mouth, by curse words, you know. I, I'll, I'll never forget a guy I worked with at Coke that talked about how much he loved Jesus, but he kept damning him every other word. And it's like, I'm confused. It's like, if you say that you love him, then why would you use his name in vain so much? I mean, it just kind of sends this dual message. And so it's very important that we pray as the psalmist, he's, he's saying, God, please restrain my mouth because I understand that this could hurt your reputation. And I, I want the words of my mouth to be acceptable in your sight, right? And so this is what he's praying for. God, for the rest of my days, please help me control my tongue. Then notice what happens in verse number two. He says, I was mute with silence. I held my peace even from good and my sorrow was stirred up. My heart was hot within me while I was musing. The fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. Now, he makes the mistake here of not managing his emotions, so to speak. So number two, God, for the rest of my days, please help me to manage my emotions. Please help me to manage my emotions. Um, there's two ways that people deal, there's a lot of ways that people deal with stuff, but let's simplify it and say that one way of people dealing with, with uh, the emotions that they feel on the inside is just to explode. You know, it's like, this is what I feel, and boom, and everybody knows it, and there's shrapnel, and, and there's just this explosion. The other side is to kind of internalize everything. Now, I'm no psychologist, and I'm not, but, but I've been around people long enough to then when somebody says, when you say, is everything okay? And you're like, yeah, everything's good. Okay, not everything's good. So they're kind of, they're, they're, they're internalizing everything. And this is what the psalmist is doing, where he is obviously hurting, he's obviously upset, and it's, he's internalizing everything, and he's just kind of in his own little bubble, and he's, he says, What's happening to me is I'm not even, I'm not expressing any emotion at all. I'm not, I'm not, I won't even say things that I know would be helpful to people because I'm just internalizing everything. And then what he does is then it burns up so much and then he, 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 then I spoke with my tongue. So he, he kind of didn't do the first thing he asked God to do, which was to help him control his tongue. By now he's just kind of holding everything in um, and he just, he has gone into a shell and done nothing. And that's not healthy. Um, there's, you know, we can be passive aggressive in, in how we treat people and how we deal with people. And this is a little bit of what the psalmist is going through here. He, he's, he's just kind of getting into his own little world. He's not properly expressing his emotion. He's, he's not getting help. He's not talking to somebody. He's not crying out to God. He's just kind of internalizing everything. And we all need help in managing our emotions. And, and there's just, our, our feelings can be so incredibly tricky, can't they? I mean, I don't know if you all feel that way. But we can, we can read into things and see things that aren't there. And we start looking at the world through our eyes. And we get emotional about stuff because we think this person was, was doing this disrespectfully and they weren't doing that at all. I can't even begin to describe to you. I wish you could take in, you inside my brain when I'm preaching and I'm looking out and seeing what I'm seeing. And it's hard not to take stuff personal if you've ever done any public speaking, you know, because this guy over here looks like he's totally taking a nap and uh, this person over here is messing around and then you start taking everything personal and then you're trying to talk about how Jesus is good and you're ticked off on the inside. And... And the problem is, is that we kind of, in, I'm internalizing everything and not giving it to God, casting all my cares upon him for he cares for me. I'm kind of, 
and um, it can just be unhealthy. Uh, I, I'm a big advocate of, of uh, Christian counseling. I believe you should go to people that point you to Christ and point you to the Word of God. I, I believe in that. Um, I, I, I just do. I've been myself helping me walk through some difficult uh, days in my life. I think that's a positive thing. I think um, that's a healthy thing. God's raised people up to help us walk through that, you know. And, and I think that we make a mistake when we just internalize everything and when, and when we, don't, um, we don't properly deal with our emotions. And the psalmist here is making that mistake. So I need help in managing my emotions. I, I need help in not reading into stuff, not taking everything so personally, not um, thinking that I know what somebody's feeling inside their heart or what's going on on the inside. I, I need help with that. And so I want to pray that on a daily basis. God, for the rest of my days, help me to control my tongue. Help people not to get to the end of the life and say, remember, man, what Mark said? That was really crazy. I, wanna, I want my tongue to be under control. God, help me to manage my emotions. Um, help me to properly express those emotions in a, in a helpful way, not just to walk around and internalize everything and act like everything's okay when everything's not okay. And this is his prayer. God, help me to do that in a proper way, manage my emotions. Because then he says in verse 4, Lord... Make me to know my end and what is the measure of my days that I may know how frail I am. Number three, God, for the rest of my days, please help me keep a proper perspective. Please help me keep a proper perspective. Can I tell you that I think one of the greatest mistakes in life we, we all make is to miss the moment we're in, you know? Maybe I'm just living this out myself, you know, but I, I remember when the kids were born, I was kind of like, man, I can't wait till we're not, you know, where we can actually communicate, you know, where we're not doing this baby talk thing that, you know, I can speak, and they can speak, and we can understand each other. And then they got into elementary, and I'm like, man, I can't wait till I can take my boys out and post them up. And that's a basketball term, you know. I can, I can, I can play them in basketball, and we can play one-on-one. -on -one and I, I can't wait till we get out of this, you know, where they, they can't even dribble the ball. You know, you're playing catch, or they're throwing it on the ground, or, you know. Well, I just I, I just can't wait till they're till they're teenagers, you know, till they're older and they're in high school. Then they got to be teenagers, and I was like, Lord, I can't wait till they get out of high school. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. And and as a regret, I just wish I'd have loved every moment. I actually, honestly, the, when the kids were in high school, that was my favorite time with them. I loved uh, coaching them. I loved being around them. I really did enjoy that time, um, and if I have a regret, it's that that um, I wish I'd enjoyed the the earlier moments better. There was a lady that wrote Karen the other day, uh, texted her, and, and was just having a rough time. She got a couple little kids, and and look, um, ladies, God bless you. I don't I don't know how you deal with it. And she's just kind of, she's just kind of freaking out to Karen. And I was standing over her and I was watching her. I was, I guess, stalking her while she's uh, typing on her phone. But she says, I saw Karen say, um, enjoy these days. And she goes, I miss them every day. And, and I think when we're young, we think we got, we got so much time. You know, and then, then the next thing you know, you're middle age and you have knee surgery and you're six months away from knee surgery and you can't even run down the street yet. And you're like, what happened to my body? You know, but this is the deal. I may not be able to run, but I can walk. So what I want to do is I want to enjoy this time. Lord, make me to know the end of my, make me, 
Lord, make me to know my end and what is the measure of my days and how frail I am. And I, I maybe can't do what I used to be able to do, but I still do something. So God, give me the perspective to enjoy the fact that I can do what I can do today. And that's what I believe the psalmist is praying here. See, I can go through life longing for the next thing. Because I hear people say that all the time. Oh, man, you know, I started at this job, and it's entry level, and now I've worked my way up to management. And, well, I just can't wait till I'm, I'm not in management anymore, and I'm actually running a company. And then they're running a company, and they're like, I can't wait till I can retire and get out of this. And, and, and it's just like everybody's waiting for the next thing. Man, God, help us to love where we're at right now. I did the same thing. I was an assistant pastor, and I was like, man, I can't wait till I'm the lead guy. Now I want to go back and be the second guy. <laughs> I'm not, I don't. I mean, I do, but I don't. You know what I'm saying. Anyway, so, um, but can we just enjoy the moment we have today? Listen to what else he says. Indeed, you have made my days as hand breaths, and my age is as nothing before you. Certainly every man at his best is but vapor. God, for the rest of my days, would you please help me to control my tongue, manage my emotions, keep a proper perspective, and would you please help me to stay humble? What does the psalmist say? Every man at his best state is but vapor. Right? What is life? It is but a vapor. It appears for a little time and vanishes away. How is my life being sustained? Why, how am I able to, how am I staying alive right now? Because I'm in such superior shape. Let me tell you, I'm not staying alive right now because what I had for lunch. Went to old Chicago, had double decaroni. Those are clogging your arteries by the bite. I mean, it's just, it's not necessarily, and I'm not advocating eating unhealthy, and actually I've been trying to eat healthier, but, but the reality is, is that I'm alive because my life is in God's hands, and he could snuff it out at any moment. And so he, he blesses me with the opportunity to continue to live, but really, ultimately, any success that I have and my life is all because of him. So you got to kind of keep that in perspective before you get all arrogant like I am the man or I am the woman and I'm doing this and this is what's, this is the, this is what's keeping me alive and this is the best thing. And the psalmist here is saying, I understand, Lord, that my, uh, my age is as nothing before you and every man is his best but a vapor. And God could snap, snap out our lives in a moment. We are in his hand and that keeps us humble. I am not the master of my own fate. God is. <laughs> Arrogance is poison, and it destroys. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Notice what he says then in verse 6. Surely every man walks about like a shadow. Surely, the busy, surely they busy themselves in vain. He heaps up riches and does not know who will gather them. Number five, I want to pray, God, for the rest of my days, please help me wisely manage my life and money. Please help me wisely manage my life and money. Boy, I wonder what David would say if he came to our time. Because he talks to here about, surely they busy themselves in vain. <laughs> Man, I don't, we have more time-saving devices in the, his, than in the history of the world, and yet, have we ever been as busy as we are now? I mean, people are busy, 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 running here and there. And they're, they're busy, and they're trying to accumulate um, wealth, and they're trying to, to uh, get more things, and we're in a very materialistic society. And I understand that I have a responsibility to uh, feed and take care of my family and provide protection and, and take care of them. And so that requires me, that requires necessity on my part to work. Um, and I don't think that there's anything unbiblical about setting money away and preparing for the future. The Bible in, in actually encourages that. Um, 
but there is that fine balance between how much is too much and how much is uh, how much am I just being greedy here? There's a difference between greedy and, and saving. There's a difference between hoarding and saving. Um, I, I just, I don't want to be busy, busy, busy and never have time with my family and never have time with my friends and never enjoy life because I'm always just working. And I'm always just kind of saving and, and, and getting more money and getting more stuff. And this is what the psalmist is praying. God, help me. Uh, not to just spend all of my life just busy and getting things so that then when I die, the next generation just fights over that. Right? I mean, I want people to enjoy my presence, not the fact that, man, I hope he kicks the bucket soon so we can get his money. Right? God, help me to please manage my life and money wisely. Help me to... Look, I enjoy work. I enjoy labor. I don't, I don't, that, those things do not scare me, but I understand that I can go overboard with that and I can work too much and, and, and um, work can become a greater priority than people, which is, is a definite problem. Um, you know, money and having it is not a bad thing, but, but the love of it is a bad thing. God, help me to manage that. I need wisdom in that. I need wisdom in how to deal with Time and money. Those are two big things. You show me your checkbook and you show me your schedule and I'll show you what's important to you. And so I want to wisely manage those two things. And that's what I believe the psalmist is praying here. He, he's like, look, I just I look at these people and they're just busy running around and they're saving up for this rainy day that may never, they may never enjoy that money. And their kids will just fight over it when they're gone. Then he says in verse 7, And now, Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. Number six, I want to pray this. God, for the rest of my days, please help me to control my tongue, manage my emotions, keep a proper perspective. God, help me to stay humble, wisely manage my life and money. And number six, God, help me to be patient with you. God, help me to be patient with you. You ever wish God would hurry up? Is it, am I the only one in the room that would wish that sometimes? You know, God, would you please hurry? Okay, I'm, I've asked. Okay, I, I prayed about this for a whole week. Isn't that kind of how we are sometimes? God, I prayed about this for a whole week. Can, can you kind of speed this thing up? Sometimes you pray for years and years and years, and, and God's working things out. So there has to come this point in our life where we just say, okay, God, um, you're not answering this request right now, but I trust in you. This is what the psalmist is going through. He's sick, he feels like he's dying, and he wants God to heal him. He understands the brevity of his life. He understands that he has a short time. He's asking for God to do something, and God's not doing it. And so his frustration kind of sp spills out here, and, and he's, he, we see him saying, look, you know, I walk, I, I see everybody else, and they're kind of running around, and they're busy, and they're just getting money, and uh, my life is just fading from me. But then he comes to this conclusion in verse 7, but my hope's in you. You know what's best. Ultimately, that's what faith is. Faith is, God, this is what I want, but my hope is in you. You know, we have a good man in our church, um, Mike Morgan, you know, who's really uh, has a tremendous amount of health issues right now. He's got cancer. They're, they're giving him chemotherapy. As the chemotherapy is uh, shutting down his kidneys. And... Um, you know, he was in the hospital for a long time. He's now out of the hospital. Tomorrow morning, he's going to the kidney doctor. He came down here, and uh, he prayed. He asked me to pray with him today because he wants to go to the kidney doctor tomorrow, and he wants the kidney doctor to run tests on his kidneys, and, it, and everything looks good. And we prayed, God, please touch his kidney. But maybe, what if he goes tomorrow, and it's not a good report? I said, what if you go tomorrow, Mike, and it's not a good report? And he says, my hope is in the Lord.
today, this morning was just a, I don't know, there was a lot of, um, I, sometimes the weight of, you know, people come up and ask you to pray for them, and sometimes that weight gets heavy, and it was like heavy today. You know, Mike came up, and there, somebody else is like, I, I'm going to lose my job, and I don't know what to do, and uh, we may have to move, and then that made me sad because I don't want anybody to move. <laughs> you know, I mean, I know that's a part of the deal, but um, just a lot of people carrying a lot of stuff, you know. And they've been praying about it, and they want me to pray about it with them. And so I pray about it with them. But there has to come this point where with all the prayer that ultimately you go, okay, God, I trust you. My, my hope is in you. I, I trust you. That's what the psalmist finally got to, right? My hope's in you. And I pray that maybe that that you would be the same tonight. Verse number eight. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the reproach of the foolish. God, for the rest of my days, please help me control my tongue, manage my emotions. God, please help me to keep a proper perspective as I go through this life. God, help me to stay humble and wisely manage my life and money. God, help me to be patient with you. And number seven, God, help me to please live holy. Deliver me, he says, from all transgressions. Boy, the devil is a liar, isn't he? He is a liar. And, and, he, and he tells us, he, he encourages us to sin, and the sin brings us pain. And it, and it brings us some immediate gratification where we feel good in the moment, but then the result of that, the end of that, is pain and death and uh, difficulty and trials. And the psalmist is praying, Lord, I'm in this weakened emotional state. And boy, is that when it is the easiest to sin. <laughs> God, please help me to live holy. Please help me to do the right thing, even though I'm so tempted to do the wrong thing, even though I'm so tempted to say the wrong thing or go down the wrong path, and I know this would be destructive for me. God, strengthen me, empower me to live a holy life. And that's his prayer. Deliver me from my transgressions. Do not make me the reproach of the foolish. The devil has a target on everybody's back in this room. I mean, he's, he's got a... He's coming after all of you. And I'm not trying to say that to scare you. But one of his greatest tools of uh, kind of hurting the faith is, is when there are hypocritical Christians. And I pray that for all of us that God would strengthen us to do the right thing. That we would live holy lives that are pleasing to him. And that that as we live our lives, that uh, we would lift up the name of Jesus Christ by how we live. And then he says the last thing in verse number nine. He says, I was mute. I did not open my mouth because it was you who did it. Remove your plague from me. I am consumed by the blow of your hand. With my, when with rebukes you correct man for iniquity, you make his beauty melt away like a moth. Surely every man is vapor. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Do not be silent at my tears, for I am a stranger with you, a sojourner as all my fathers were. Remove your gaze from me that I may, gain, I may regain strength before I go away and am no more. The eighth thing that the psalmist prays for is that God would help him to submit to his discipline. And this is our prayer, that we would, Lord, God, for the rest of my days, please help me to submit to your discipline. I sure am glad that I had parents who loved me enough to discipline me. Now, 
I think they went over the top with me. They think they spanked me too much. I'm saying that because they're in the room. Um, but I am glad that they loved me enough to discipline me because I was a brat. You know, I really, I thought I had life figured out at six. Didn't we all? You know, we knew what was best. And, but man, my, my parents, um, I, I'm just so glad that they disciplined me. But I, can I tell you, um, I did not submit well to their discipline. You know, my, my dad would say this, and it's cliche, and I'm sure you guys have heard it, you know, but he'd go to spank me, and he'd say, now this hurts me more than it hurts you, you know. Give me that belt, and we'll see, right? I mean, that's, I mean, that's kind of that, that whole mentality of, of, yeah, I know you're saying that. I get it now, you know, being a parent. It, it, it was painful um, to discipline the kids. And so my dad would do the same thing. Like he, he, whenever I was disciplined, he'd pull me in and he would say, this is why I'm disciplining you because you, you, you disobeyed here, here, and here. And, and I love you and I'm sorry that I have to do this, but there, there's a price for sin. There's a price for disobedience. And so then he'd spank me with this paddle that they had gotten at Six Flags in St. Louis. My parents went to St. Louis and came back with a paddle. <laughs> Who does that to their children? Because I never forget. It's like, hey, we got you something. It's like, it's a paddle. It's like, we're supposed to be excited about this? But, um, but then they'd spank me, you know, and then, then um, dad would hug me and he'd say, I love you. And, you know, and so he'd hug me and I would do this. I wasn't going to hug him back. Right? Because I was mad. And I thought, I was so glad when I got to this age. I got to where I was like 14. I think the last spanking I ever got was at 14. And it was then, at that point, that it didn't, it didn't really hurt. I mean, it hurt, but it was like it was worth the crime. You know, when you're a kid, it's like, oh, this ain't, this ain't worth it. I'll never do that. But at 14, it's like, hey, it's totally worth it now. So they, I, I'll never forget the last spanking because it's like, Dad spanked me, and it was like, okay, he, that doesn't bother him anymore. But we're going to have to do something more creative. Like, he knew it, and I knew it. And then, then it was like, I wish we could go back to the spankings. I'd, I'd act like it would really hurt, you know. But I, I tell you all that to say that, you know, I thought when, when I turned 14 that the, the spankings would stop in a sense. But the, the thing that I forgot is, is that I have a loving Heavenly Father. Who disciplines me too. This is what the psalmist is going through, right? The psalmist is being disciplined by God. Was he not disciplined for his sin with Bathsheba and his murder of Uriah? Yes, he was. So he so we all have this choice. We can do what I did as a kid when the my father would discipline me and then try to hug me and tell me that he loved me, and, and we can we can bristle to it, and we can, we can kind of, you know, get, no, I don't want that. I don't deserve, or we can submit to the discipline and say, okay, I understand, God, that I'm doing this, I'm, I'm getting this because I have sinned against you, um, and I humbly come to you and I ask for your forgiveness. Because you know what this meant? This meant I don't think I deserve what I'm getting. Kind of rebellion. And isn't it God that said rebellion is the sin of witchcraft? So when God disciplines us and we get angry at him, rather than submitting to that discipline and going, okay, God, I, I get it. You have my attention. I was wrong. You were right, as you always are. So my prayer is, God, I don't, wanna, I don't want to uh, tighten up when the discipline comes. I want to submit to it. This is a good prayer to pray for the rest of our days.
God, for the rest of my days, whether it's one day or, well, 30 years, please help me every day of my life to control my tongue. Please help me to manage my emotions. Please help me to keep a proper perspective. Please help me to stay humble. Please help me to wisely manage my life and money. Please help me to be patient with you, especially when I don't understand and when you're not answering my prayers. Please help me to live holy in this sinful world. And please help me to submit to your discipline when I stray from you and you discipline me to get me back on track. Help me to get back on track and submit to that discipline. 